disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, book lovers. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and you're listening to the Thinking on Paper book club, where we read books that have stood the test of time, books that will change your mind. If you go to thinkingonpaper.xyz, you can read our other books in the series, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. We spent six chapters on Shane Parrish, Clear Thinking. We've read The Nexus, which was the best book of 2023-24. Hands down, you will not read a better book than The Nexus this year, guaranteed. That's a that's a thinking on paper promise, Jeremy, and I will stand by it and back it up. I'll 100% stand by it too. That book actually started this this whole book club thing, right? Like, yeah, it, the intersection of art, technology, and science. Fascinating how Julio Atino strings all that stuff together. Uh, it validates the people thinking on the fringe and all. It's it was incredible. Yeah, I'd yeah. I'd stamp it. So thinking on paper X Y Z to go back to that because to here today we're reading super quantum supremacy and begins with the question can machines think and this was a question that dominated the historic 1956 dartmouth conference which gave birth to an entirely new field of science dubbed artificial intelligence it'll never catch on um, it started with a bold proposal that read an attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. I love that last bit, and improve themselves. Took a bit longer than they thought. They thought it would take a summer. It's taken about 60 summers and counting, or 70. <laughs> My math isn't very good. We're still not um, there, yep. But chapter 12, AI and quantum computers. Jeremy, it, first impressions. Can machines think? Yes. Um, not yes to that question, but yes to the handoff, uh, for me to talk a little bit. The thing that I got out about the, the thing that shook out for me was this, this whole top down, bottom up thing that we, that we tend to talk about a lot, right? So the top down approach, you know, people, you know, back in 56, Marvin Minsky and all the stuff you mentioned at Dartmouth, they're like, okay, how do we just cram all this information into this machine? And then like a, like a robot, you know, they'll understand the laws of physics and motion and all of that in, in real time. But the bottom up thing, you know, animals like when an animal's born, right? Animal, you know, a, a, a calf is born, right? It flops on the ground and then starts figuring out, okay, well, if I move these things, I can kind of move like mom does over there and, and that sort of thing. So uh, Rodney Brooks from MIT is referenced in here as well. And, um, you know, it, it thought about, are we asking AI the wrong questions? Are we treating it? with with the wrong process of 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 teaching it to learn and you know you think about there was a great analogy in here about you know a fly as well right so this this small engineering mar marvel of how a fly literally flies around in you know with amazing accuracy and that sort of thing better than most of our planes can do right so this is something the fly does naturally that comes out it's not crammed with a bunch of information on you know physics and that sort of thing it just does it and nature does it nature wins again kind of thing so that that led to this whole learning process like this you know hey we got to teach this stuff instead of just cram it all in there and have it access it so that's what i got out of this thus far yep yeah, and i i'm going to it's a bit like star wars when luke skywalker turns off his tracking system and goes i don't need that um going beyond this I, so on the show, we've had a lot of quantum guests recently. We've had IBM on, we've had D-Wave on. We had um, Blake Johnson, the head of quantum engineering at I IBM, and he was speaking about AI. And I think there's a lot of filler in this, in this chapter, which essentially can be like diluted down into quantum is the muscle that makes the AI much more useful. Um, and it just with with quantum's ability to sift through data at light speed, it may it takes away the burden that classical computing can't do with their brute force effort. It takes too long, and the, the the connection between AI and quantum is how quantum can be the muscle. And we spoke to um, carrying on the IBM. They're doing about post quantum cryptography, and they're using AI. It can be almost like a stress tester for some of the stuff that quantum can do where AI is capable of testing the limits of what these systems can produce much more quickly and readily than a human can. That's pretty well summarized. I mean, there, there are definitely some interesting examples of, you know, 
AI combined with quantum and, and what it could do. I mean, the protein folding problem is super interesting, right? Yeah. It, you know, what AlphaFold is doing, you know, describing shapes of 350,000 proteins, 250,000 of which are new. So the amount of data and the amount of interact, I think it's the interaction of the data, right? That we're starting okay. to learn is the big thing that, that, that quantum can help with instead of, you know, just, you know, I think the last example from, um, from D wave, uh, Murray, Tom talked about, you know, Pokemon and, and basically having like two cards and, you know, a computer, a classical computer analyzing the two cards and being able to go, well, that one's not really great. Let's draw another one and see what that combination does. Quantum can kind of like think about multiple, can think about six cards, eight cards, all of the little interconnections between the superpowers on these Pokemon cards, right? Um, it's more of the activation of the adjacent possible, I think, is where my brain Ooh, lands. I like that. Say right? that again. The Say that again. <laughs> the activation of the adjacent possible, right? That you know, yeah. quantum can kind of pull these things, these these intricate dependencies uh, between disparate things, right? Uh, mic drop, yeah. Beautiful. Boom, boom. Shall we bounce to immortality? You know, we talked yeah. about AI. Should we jump right into immortality? So this is chapter 13. This is... <laughs> who, who wants to live forever? Brian Johnson wants to live forever. That he does. And he should come on the show. Brian, you should come on the show and talk with us about that. The, the blueprint. Gilgamesh. King Gilgamesh. Yeah. So we've been talking about immortality. Like Gilgamesh, the story of Gilgamesh. I, I, okay. I, 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 it's from like... 1500 BC. It's one of the oldest stories that we have from Iraq, I believe, but it doesn't, it's one of the oldest stories, perhaps the oldest story that we have in the human, the canon of humanity. And it's, it's a, it's about living forever. It's about immortality. It's not just about that, but um, Gilgamesh um, goes on a madder and his friend gets killed. He wants to live forever. And, you know, it's not a new. Yeah. And so the, the, the interesting things that popped out, and we've talked about this in this book a lot. And uh, Professor Kaku would love to have you on the show. You know, if you if you would uh, make some time to join us because we've got some thoughts and and stuff. I, I love what's been done with this book about kind of setting setting the stage for the things that are happening now, but diving deep into those things. Like we're talking about like aging, right? What does aging have to do with quantum? But it's he's setting the stage between you know from what is aging and how does the aging process can it be understood better with quantum so um that's good but like the quantum nuggets i think you and i are finding that we just because we're in quantum a little bit more we need maybe some more nuggets but let's talk about aging like does immortality violate the laws of physics was a question i wrote well down. this well the second law of ther thermodynamics is this entropy are we going back to carlo rovelli oh and gosh. entropy it is the second law of thermodynamics that dom dominates our lives. It is a law of physics that mandates that things will eventually rust, disintegrate, and die. This means that entropy, which is a measurement of chaos and possibly time, if you read our other book club on that, uh, always increases. It seems that this iron law forbids immortality because in the end, everything falls apart. Physics seems to have a death warrant for all life Ooh. on Earth. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So entropy is the measurement of chaos always increasing. Right. And, but, but the thing about it is that the, the, the way he debunks this is everything to the idea that everything decays in, in folds into more chaos only applies to a closed system. When energy can flow in from an external system, this idea is reversed and guess what energy we get energy from the sun. Right. So, you know, are we in fact a closed system? Maybe there is an idea, right? Um, and rusty, we get rusty and musty, right? I never thought about this, right? As we get old, we actually get rusty. Like there's an oxidation effect that happens within ourselves that that I really didn't that I really didn't know or understand. Did you know that? Before? It, yeah, I can feel it in my knees every day. Oh my day. gosh. <laughs> Yeah, it well, and this other thing about aging it again, I'm not sure how much you know going into this. This is just me nerding out on 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 some really cool nuggets that he's put in this chapter. Um, aging as the accumulation of errors in molecules, genes, and cells. The accumulation of errors. That's pretty interesting, right? Yeah, again, I can feel the accumulation of errors in my knees. Um, but 
again, what does this have to do with quantum computers? I think that those errors, again, it's something which you theoretically could model with a quantum computer. So the quantum computer would be able to model where those errors are, where that decay is happening, and then uh, combine it with other technologies with CRISPR, and then you could reprogram those errors to turn the, the clock back on them to 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 remove those errors. I don't know, but to make them disappear. The then... question, the question I would love to have answered, and and I have this listed as a potential quantum project that uh, Professor Kaku r references, like that I would want to jump right into D Wave or jump into Cascade or something and play around with is you know this this idea of uh, telomerase, right, or telomerase, T E L O M E R A S E, um, which you know, I learned about telomeres uh, a long time, which is like these little, these little hairs on your, on your cells that actually get shorter as more errors occur. And I learned that, um, from, uh, who was it? Deepak Chopra, I think was talking about telomeres. And as you, and if you can focus on, you know, re resisting the shortening of your telomeres, you could actually prevent the aging process. But then on the flip side, here's the quantum problem, right? That, that we could think about that. If you use, if you use this this telomerase to actually uh, cause cells to be immortal, you can also spark them to become cancerous, right? So that's a lot of interdependency. That's a lot of things interacting to try and figure out the answer to. And what a great opportunity for quantum computers to to kind of prove their worth and in, in helping us figure that out. Well, again, it's, yeah, um, quantum computers may be able to solve the mystery of how telomerase can cause a cell to become immortal, but not cancerous. Yeah, again, it's this shifting through the data. Um, cal cal caloric restriction. So in spite of all the quack cures and therapies over the centuries to increase our lifespan, one method has withstood the test of time and seems to work in every case. The only proven way in which to lengthen the lifespan of an animal is through caloric restriction. Do you know, I've got a, a theory, Jeremy, uh -oh. about, about this. And it's... <laughs> women live longer than men on average. And I, I, it's all down to caloric restriction, I think. And I'm... And I'm basing this theory off my two children. I have a son and a daughter and they're eight and five. And now I've had five years of comparing their eating habits. And my son eats more calories than my daughter. Every meal time, it's a little bit more. Some some meal times, it's a lot more. So, uh, and I think over the years, and I, I imagine that's playing out in every, almost every family where we are lucky enough to eat three meals a day, that right. the, the, the boys are eating more than the girls. And that's why <laughs> women live longer than men on average, because of the amount of calories that they ingest over their lifetime. Debunk that. Yes, Bam. that is. Well, <laughs> well uh, you and you and Professor Kaku could start a, a new a new diet trend uh, and call it like 30 for 30. I, I want Brian ESPN. I want Brian Johnson on the show. We'll do it at midnight. I like I yeah, I want him on the show. I want to see what he thinks about quantum computing. What how could he could incorporate that into his blueprint of immortality? Or maybe yep. we get him and, and him and Kaku in a in a battle. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Well, yeah. So the, the the reference in here has again has nothing to do with quantum, but set, sets the stage for what it can be done. It, you eat thirty percent less, you live thirty percent longer. Um, I don't know. I might think about that. And you know, when I reach for that extra pizza slice tonight, you know, maybe I think about you know. Hey, are you not? Are you not an intermittent faster, Jeremy? I am. Yeah, I haven't eaten anything yet, and I don't usually eat until after my workout, which is you know sometimes around noon or one o'clock. So I usually eat about two or two thirty for my first for first meal. Smart. Have you ever done a 24, 72, 48 hour fast? Have you ever done I actually, longer? I actually haven't. I haven't done that. Okay. All right. So the so the takeaway on this again, you know, quantum theme is you know we want to understand understand things at a molecular level in a yeah. in a number of instances right and and that's that's what you know quantum uh professes to to be helpful in that's a good idea yeah, okay that makes sense so what's happening it's not about you eat less you live longer it's about you eat less what happens at the molecular level with inside you that quantum computers can replicate that process understand that process kind of give us the keys to that process that then we could incorporate elsewhere 
Yeah, it's 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 like complex systems and complicated systems, right? You know, it seems like, and this points back, Julio Atino, shout out the Nexus man. You know, you started this whole thing for us, but uh, complicated systems. You know, classical computers can deal with complicated systems pretty well. Um, you know, it, it, I guess it's safe to say that complex systems, which have this emergent property to them are better satisfied, are better dealt with, are better organized through quantum computers. There you have it. Well, well, well put. Um, chapter, chapter 14. So chapter 14, I think we need to, again, throw the book away as we are the 1st of November, 2024. This is being filmed. We've had the past month well, your neck of the woods has been wrecked by a one of the biggest hurricanes, two of the biggest hurricanes on record. I live in France, not so far from here. Valencia in Spain has had a year's rain in a day. And I, I, I find it quite hard to grasp a year's worth of rain in one day. But I guess the result is those the images that you see coming out of Valencia, which look, it looks like a tsunami's hit it. Um, I live in the French Alps. It didn't snow where I live. I live at 900 meters. It didn't snow last summer. I can literally go up the mountains and I can listen to the glaciers melted. I don't need to see it. I can hear it. I can, it, 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 it's wow. happening. Wow. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no arguing that. I think I, it's amazing to me and I don't want to get too political here, but it's amazing to me that people don't believe that, that this is, that this is happening. Are there any repercussions to some of the industrial decisions that we, that we make? We talked to Don Norman a lot about that on the episode. Yeah. He's the author of design of Every, everyday things. Um, we did that in the book club as well, but he, you know, he talked about designing for humanity, right? Humanity centered yeah. design and focusing on, you know, not building shit that we won't use and we'll just throw away, not building things that will, you know, just get dropped in the ocean. Right. You know, it, yeah. I, let's okay. Let's not stay political. If there's any flat earthers watching this, then <laughs> keep watching. And all I ask is like open, have an open mind. So okay, he talks about polar vortex. He talks about carbon dioxide. He talks about the processes. Again, we're looking at quantum computers to what's happening on the molecular level. Can we learn something about it? Um, geoengineering. I want to talk about this because we had a guest on not so long ago. Um, and Alexandra Whittington, who spoke about geoengineering. Yep. So we're a tech podcast. Let's look at some of these. So one of the ways that we could slow down or turn back or do something about it. So carbon sequestration, weather modification, algae blooms, rain clouds, plant trees. Um, any of those that particularly you want to mention, Jeremy? Yeah. And these, these are like, as he listed, these are like the worst case scenario things that you jump into to do. I mean, you know, weather modification was talking about, you know, releasing particulate matter, just like a man-made volcano ish that could cool the earth. Right. So if you do that, you know, this is all the, 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 the complicated interdependencies, right? So if you do that, what other dependencies are are going to click off, and could we end up in an ice age if we put too much shit up in the air? And you, you, know. you kill you kill the bees, don't you? Basically, you stop right. photosynthesis, you kill all the bees, and then we're really screwed. Dude, the bees are done. We're done. Like it's <laughs> it's a hundred percent. Yeah, I I think I think some of the, some of the, I think the reason again why you put some of that stuff in there is like to figure out whether or not those things work, and it's not it's not going to hurt more than it helps. You got to have. Uh, a computing platform that understands yep. um, all these variables, so many variables that, that that are connected to each other to even figure that out. What what I thought was really interesting, kind of the little nugget that I pulled out of this chapter is like that weather models are based on this 311 square mile grid that extends vertically in 10 layers. And this is according to Professor Kaku. I haven't validated this with any of my own research. I'm just calling it as he calls it. Um, the interesting thing that could allow our weather prediction capability to get better is if we can if we can squash that that grid down a little bit, we can actually uh, get more accurate with it. Because think about like cloud cover, right? Seventy percent, I think, of the world on average is covered in clouds, and that the formations change by the minute. So yeah. think about most, like most of those are in England. 
That's right. Yeah. We actually have some here uh, today, which is, which is interesting. We haven't gotten a lot of rain um, out on our side, but um, before the, before the mustache guy, you know, before you turn into your parents guy comes in the screen and says, Hey, stop talking about the weather old guys. Um, <laughs> going back to just imagine 70% of the earth is covered in clouds on average. Those formations are changing by the minute and how that affects the data change in all of these layers in each of the 311 square mile grids. That's so much information, so many intricate interdependencies, right? So with quantum, we can reduce those grids, we can factor in more variables, and we can maybe even get more accurate about what's happening weather-wise. So that was my takeaway on this one. I, I like that. That actually makes it makes sense for me. So the the weather modification, you don't you don't seed the clouds and or create a cloud cover for two years to see what happens you actually you you model it on the quantum computers don't you so that essentially he's mentioning these things so quantum could model these so we don't have to try them in a worst case scenario i can do the the weather prediction for you though over the next couple of years because it's just like it's hotter it's drier it's raining more it's colder everywhere there you go so everything's amplified all of the yeah. things are amplified that's what it is isn't it it's this amplification it's not global warming because in, in some parts it'll be colder than it av on average it should be in some places it'll be hotter wetter drier what does technology do but amplify things amplify the noise mm. amplify mm. the uncertainty um we could yeah we should probably not talk about the weather but just one little thing that i want to mention is that, that, that everyone talks about this global warming of this average temperature and it's very important that that's an average temperature i live in a part of the world where it's two and a half degrees um hotter than it was before the industrial revolution there are countries there are places where it's not nowhere near that two percent so it's a global average and there are places where you can just see the impact well also think about all right so thinking about technology thinking about its effects on environment, right? So you've got these massive data centers. We talked about talked about this with the D-Wave, Murray Tom yesterday, I think, or, or did a lot this week. Um, and the, the fact that, you know, AI is, is requiring all of these data centers to, to increase in size and increase in power consumption, and cooling requirements and all of that stuff. He actually mentioned over the long haul, like once quantum gets figured out, the power requirements for quantum computers are far less than traditional computers. So as we as we watch this quantum cycle start to kind of kind of grow and be more implement or be implemented to more practical uses, could we see the consumption of um, data center power go down over time? Interesting. And on that note, let's let's close the chapter, my guy. Yeah, let's close the chapter. The next chapter is called sun in a bottle and we'll be talking about that next week on the last book club of quantum supremacy we're back on photosynthesis i'm excited let's go let's let's go so thank you yeah be disruptive stay curious keep thinking on your papers and we'll, we'll see you next week for book club